Yep, we are looking good. Hello everyone, how's it going? Tim here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 11. Gonna do some JavaScript news. Um, as usual, you can find everything that I mentioned on GitHub under building X with JS slash BXGS Weekly and episodes folder. There's a markdown files with every date, episode and whatever. All the old links are there as well as new ones. Um, we do have not that many articles today, but quite a lot of releases and a lot of really cool libs and demos for today. So I'm guessing this podcast is not going to be that long, but uh, you know, let's just get started and see where we get, right? Um, so the first thing we get today is an article called Is GraphQL the future? Let me move the microphone a bit closer, probably. So the article talks, uh, it's basically, basically a discussion, I think, piece about uh, GraphQL and if it's an proper replacement for REST API, if it's gonna replace the REST completely, if it's gonna make REST obsolete, and you know, what kind of advantages does it have, what kind of disadvantages does it have. It is very much, um, as I said, a think piece, so you won't find any code here, like maybe just a bit of GraphQL itself, but it is nonetheless very interesting insight into the GraphQL from a person who it seems used it quite extensively after using REST for some time. So if you wanted to know more about GraphQL from a meta perspective, let's call it this way, uh, then this is an article that you should definitely read. Continuing, we got an article from Mozilla guys. Uh, it's called Debugging Modern Web Applications. And it talks about the improvements coming to the Firefox debugger as well as the um, uh, something, I, I okay, not in this article, that's gonna talk about that a bit later, but this is basically uh, talking about the improvements coming, yes, to the Firefox debugger with uh, um, source maps and how they correctly map the compiled code. That is, you know, uh, something that you write is not actually what you get in a browser, right? Because you use Webpack, Babel, and all that other stuff that, actually transforms your code quite a bit. So to properly debug it, you need the source maps to work. So it's uh, very interesting to get some insights on how, how it works and what kind of improvements you uh, can get from them. Uh, again, this is a reference to Firefox Developer Edition, which we're gonna talk a bit in the releases part. Okay, continuing, we got an article, again, strictly not JavaScript, uh, or I guess not strictly JavaScript, because it does, if you write any Node.js servers, you will have to deal with that. The article is called The Headers We Don't Want, and it is essentially a collection of all the server headers that you might get, and uh, headers that, well, you don't really need, right? So some legacy headers, some headers that were uh, used before, some headers that are no longer needed, some deprecated standards, and um, this is actually really useful. So I had a problem, I think last time I was looking up the X cache header, was it, or Pragma or something among those lines, which is still was working with PHP like five years ago or something. And it was really hard to find any info on what kind of header is that, is it even required, <clears throat> apologies. And you know, how do I deal with it? Well, this article actually gives you quite an insight into what those headers are, where they come from, and if you really need them or if you can just drop them and, you know, leave, live without them. So yeah, that's a pretty good one. I would definitely bookmark it. It looks like they are planning to extend it at some later points because this is from the Fastly um, company, which uh, yeah, let's see how that continues, but definitely useful one. All right, continuing, we got, uh, well, this is actually a link to a talk, uh, which is called X things you need to know before implementing cryptography. So there is, this is a talk from UIconf 18 from Berlin, and there's a link to a slides and the video link coming soon, which I think is really cool because while the slides are pretty useful and there's a lot of very interesting information on them and very useful uh, tips, but it will be even better to actually listen to what the author has to say, because you know, slides are all good and, and everything, but you always give more information during talks when you actually talk about things that you show, right? So um, eagerly waiting for that, but uh, yes, just bookmark that and wait a bit for the video. Okay, continuing, we got uh, an article called Deploy a Commercial Next.js Application with PKG and Docker. It's an essentially a tutorial that walks you through uh, using PKG to build an XGS app and package it into Docker using the multi-stage builds. If you watched any of my tutorial videos, you probably know how to do all of that already. If not, then this is a really good starting point that explains how the Next.js works, how the PKG works, 
how you can compile your Node.js app into one simple binary and how you can package that binary into Docker container using the Docker multistage builds and Alpine, <clears throat> Alpine image that will be super tiny, which is, you know, which is great. And then, okay, deploy into now shell, but uh, you can also deploy it to your own Docker backed server, right? So using ExoFrame, for example, version 3.0 coming soon. All right. <laughs> Continuing, we got uh, debugging React like a champ with VS Code, uh, which is essentially a tutorial on how to correctly debug um, React apps in a browser in Chrome specifically in this case, using VS Code and debugger for Chrome extension. So if you didn't know, uh, Chrome DevTools provide you a special debug protocol that can be used from outside the browser and any external app that talks it can connect to the Chrome and debug whatever is running in it. So this is exactly, I think something is a bit blocked. Let me just do this. This is exactly what this tutorial walks you through. So you can actually uh, install. Okay, this is actually installing the extension. You can install the extension, you can point it towards your Chrome and then you can just run the debugger in VS Code and just debug it right there with the breakpoints, with all the information that you will have about the stack and variables and everything right in your VS code, which is pretty amazing. So if you didn't know that, or was confused on how to properly debug stuff using VS code, do have a look, it's a great tutorial. And uh, it even talks about setting up continuous testing with Jest and stuff. So it's, you know, a good starting point. Right, continuing, we got another meta article, or I guess think piece, uh, what if JavaScript wins? This is from uh, Anil Dash. Um, the guy who works at Fog Creek Software, the guys who made Glitch, the platform that I covered in my last podcast, is like a platform, like a playground or coding sandbox for Node.js and JavaScript. Pretty great one, so to say. And uh, he basically talks about the implications of JavaScript winning the language wars, or I guess dominating the programming language landscape, because this is the way it goes right now, right? So we slowly move into the phase where as um, who was it? I think it was, um, was it the creator of JavaScript? I'm, I'm trying to, was it Brennan Eich or someone else? Someone, I, I think it's Brennan Eich. He was like, if something can be written in JavaScript, it will be written in JavaScript, right? So we are kind of moving closer and closer to that specific, especially with WebAssembly and all the other things coming on. And uh, it kind of starting to look that JavaScript at some point will dominate the whole, um, programming scene, right? And yeah, there's an interesting thought that software is being evaluated based on social success and social merits. So you know, GitHub rankings and, and uh, user acceptance, rather than uh, objective technical merits, which might not always be good, but that's just the way it is. And uh, it is interesting, uh, like, the, it's just interesting to read through that and think and try to answer the same questions the author asks about what would happen if for the first time in the computer, like, you know, computer existence, essentially, one language would be so dominant, all the other alternatives would be just filling, you know, the tiny niches. So that's, I don't know, JavaScript will became like Microsoft of software. So we have like, you know, 90, 80% of market dominated by it. And then other 10 to 20% are minor small languages like, you know, Linux and Mac OS does right now. It's an interesting question and um, I'm honestly also quite interested on where it will go and how it will develop because the speed that JavaScript developed with right now, the, you know, the decisions of TC39, the proposals coming and they are just like crazy amount of them and all of them are actually good. I don't, I don't think I've seen even one proposal that I was looking at, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I need that. I'm like, all the stuff they wanna implement are actually useful, so that's great. All right, continuing, we got uh, how JavaScript works, tracking changes in the DOM using Mutation Observer. Um, essentially, again, a tutorial about Mutation Observer. So if you did not know the Mutation Observer is, uh, let me just permit all the JavaScript. Mutation Observer is the um, DOM API that allows you to monitor any DOM changes, right, on the browser side. So you can actually tap into the element and just, see mutations. It can be useful for a bunch of cases and uh, this is essentially a tutorial. Mutation Observer works almost in every possible browser. It can Opera Mini, I'd, like 
Does anyone still use Opera Mini? That's a good question. I'm like wondering what the market share for that is because that looks a bit off. But yeah, you know, if you're using Opera Mini, tough luck. Um, otherwise, it's just about in everything. So it can be quite uh, helpful. Again, Mutation Events is an extension of Imitation Observer. Um, it was introduced in year 2000, actually. Okay, wow, that's actually quite old. I did not know it was that old. And it seems like it's not completely supported everywhere, but it also seems to be a working draft, which is also interesting. So it's like 18 years for a working draft, which is curious. The cool thing is that you can actually use Mutation Observer to catch CSS animations and do some crazy stuff with that. But yeah, so if you are interested, do have a look. Uh, there's some pretty cool things here and maybe you will find a use case for it. Right, continuing, we got a first look at Angular Ivy, the rewrite of Angular rendering engine, or I guess it's not a rewrite, it's just a completely new rendering engine. I'm not sure if it's a rewrite or they just build it from scratch. And uh, it looks like it's gonna be pretty exciting for Angular Frogs because you know, after seeing this image, the 3.2 kilobyte bundle of the Angular app is pretty damn impressive. This is like some preact level um, optimizations over here. And this is really cool. It's always great to see people squeezing out so much out of a pretty complex JavaScript framework, to be honest, right? So just tree shaking and all that kind of stuff. So if you're an Angular guy, do have a look at this. It looks pretty damn fantastic, to be honest. Okay. Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, I think I need to permit everything. I'm gonna regret that probably. But I'm gonna do that anyway. Um, can I play that? I, I don't know if it actually plays. Okay, I have my speakers turned off, but anyway. So, so this is a website that says make front end shit again. And uh, yeah, scroll down for awesomeness. So we have a people counter here. I don't know, like if you're, if you've ever been in the internet in the 80s and 90s, you know what this is. You, you exactly know what happens. There's even a Korean translation here. Wow, okay. Um, so the idea, the whole gist of the site, right, is that the front end used to be fun, right? We built, we had FTP, we had Blink, we had HTML, we had jQuery. I mean, we still have jQuery and HTML. And we had GeoCities. Yeah, GeoCities was fun. I even have my website on GeoCities that was about hacking. I literally had like a collection of hacking articles with some, uh, I mean, it's, I guess I wouldn't call them hacking. It was more like script kitty articles, but you know, whatever it was. It was when I was like seven years old or something. So, you know, um, <laughs> there are some inspiration websites that are just as great as this one. <gasps> right click is disabled. Oh no, um, shift click, there we go. So yes, those websites are just as great as you can see. Um, epilepsy warning, I guess. Um, okay, there's even flash player ones. Do not press yes, big red button. Uh, no, I'm not gonna do that. There is a lot of those websites and all of them are great. And the whole point of the website is again, we used to make websites and it was fun. And at some point we just lost the way. Although, you know, I kind of disagree with that. It's like, there's just more businesses and more people who want to do serious stuff. But it is true that we need to make dumb shit again. We need to make useless stuff and make the web fun again and make just something that is fun and not necessarily useful, right? And if you have any cool ideas, or you want to do a website like this, then go for it. Don't let anyone say that this is shit. I mean, it kind of is, but it's a fun shit. So, you know, that's great. Hey, my Patricks, how's it going? We are making front end shit again. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. All right. Um, so yes, don't let anyone tell you that adding visitor counters on websites is bad. Just just a dancing baby. That, that gif is like 30 years old. Oh my God. All right, let us continue. Uh, we got the um, some news from Microsoft. So it is not just um, about Edge and the article is called Introducing Microsoft Edge DevTools Protocol, right? It is called Microsoft Edge DevTools Protocol, but it actually extends beyond that. So this article talks about the new initiative. Like, first of all, it's a new protocol in the Edge. And you're going to be able to use it in the same way that you can use the Chrome DevTools protocol to talk to them remotely, for example, from VS Code. So you, you could only do that in Chrome, I believe, up until now. But Microsoft, along with other guys, are taking the initiative and creating the um, protocol. Uh, where was it? Yeah. DevTools protocol in web platform incubator community groups. Or so this is actually going to be an official spec 
And if all browsers pick it up, right, we are actually going to be able to have one unified debugging protocol across all the browsers. So you write one debugging adapter, like for VS Code, and then you can use it agnostically with any browser, right? And for now, we have it like in Chrome, WebKit, and Node.js, because this is like V8, right? And Firefox, uh, they do have something coming quite soon, I believe, in the next one of the next releases. And Edge is also coming. Uh, again, this is where we came from, right? So they just announced it. So it is really awesome to see that um, they are pushing for one standardized protocol, not just developing 25 of them. No more browser wars and all that bollocks. We, we need more standards, to be honest. Okay, so this is a cool one. Moving next, we got another proposal. So this is JavaScript proposal. Um, I believe it's not even a strawman proposal yet. So this is just a sketch, essentially. The proposal is for blocks, or I guess blocks. I'm, I'm not sure how to read that, but that's just called blocks for to make it easier. The idea is really simple. So um, sometimes you have libraries that take in parameters, right? And if the library is built correctly, you can pass in the function as a parameter that will eventually resolve into something. And then the uh, function that you passed in will be awaited, for example, and used as an argument. But that's not always the case. So the proposal is to create those uh, blocks that will evaluate first and then the result of that block. So in this case, JSON to first name will be passed in as an argument to this function worker, right? Which sounds like a sensible idea. I don't know if it's gonna even go to a straw man because it still feels a bit weird and I have some, um, how to say, some concerns about the syntax and stuff, but the proposal definitely makes some sense and I would be interested to see, you know, I mean, on one hand you would think, you know, maybe it's just easier to rewrite the library to use, um, proper arguments or maybe to just get the argument first and then invoke the library. So it's it's kind of, I'm not convinced that we 100% need it, but it looks interesting. Let's just put it this way. Uh, so yeah, definitely gonna keep an eye on that and see if it moves anywhere. All right, continuing, we got yet another proposal or I guess drafts in this case, it's already a spec draft. Um, we're actually getting a picture in picture draft. So this is like, web platform picture in picture. This is also in web platform incubation community group. And uh, if you didn't know Safari uh, on Mac and on Windows as well, or whatever, you, I think you can install it anywhere nowadays, but basically Safari had a picture in picture mode for HTML5 videos. So if you go on YouTube, you can pop out the video in a frameless window and then you can drag it around and do whatever else with Safari, right? Chrome is getting this feature with the next release, I believe, or maybe in two releases or whatever. So they're basically adding it. But they was like, okay, you know, we're gonna add it, but let's let's make it standard. So, you know, let's not just cook up some half-baked Chrome API, let's just make a standard out of it and make it available for everyone, which is again, an awesome thing and I fully support that. Um, they're actually adding, uh, or they are planning to add the um, JavaScript API. So here's an example that you can actually see. So what you can do is you can basically say, hey, you know, on click request picture in picture and if user approves, I guess you will get it. If not, then it's gonna just throw it right so looks interesting looks really cool i do think picture in picture can be useful in more than one case and having it natively in browser is a really good step for a web platform so we'll see how that goes all right um there's a yeah i guess smaller news or kind of semi news if you used uh on pkg which is a cdn for um npm packages so if you didn't know there's a really cool website that where you can just go and get any scripts from uh, npm by literally just saying the package name so if i actually say slash react slash i would actually get the listing of the whole package right so there's like well um common js umd packages whatever you can explore it and you can use it in your development in production as well because it's pretty stable and the cool thing is that they just added the, they are now serving HTML files with content type text HTML, which means you can actually publish a full website on NPM and then just serve it from on PKG, which is pretty damn amazing. So, or you can serve the documentation from there, which is also a use case, right? So it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what people come up with and uh, what about bad people? Yeah, so there's some some concerns, I guess, about that, but 
it's still a really, really cool development. All right, continuing, we got a small VS Code tip. Um, turn your VS Code into a quick notepad by setting files.default language to markdown in your settings, Jason, which basically turns any new window into a markdown window, which I already did because it's immensely helpful because sometimes I just need to take notes and it's way easier to do it in markdown. So, you know, that's, that's just an awesome tiny tip for you. All right, we are now in the releases section. That's it for news. As I said, there's not that many of them. We're now getting into releases and we have quite a bunch of them and some are pretty large. The first one being Next.js version six and Next.js.org, an official website for it. Um, Next.js six features a bunch of really cool things. So you, first of all, you finally get zero configuration static exports. I mean, it wasn't that hard before, but you know, now it's just zero config, which is really cool. You get uh, app.js underscore app.js file, an extension point that allows you to do some really cool things like page transitions, error boundaries, and so on and so forth. Um, we're now updated to Babel 7 that adds, among other things, fragments index, which is also really cool. And there's some like additional flow annotations in core base, and then, you know, um, minor things for docs and everything like that's more boring side. Let me just show you the app component and what you can do with it. So there's this page transitions things that looks amazing. Just look at that. That is made in Next.js and just looks really, really fancy. I mean, it's a bit janky. I don't know if it's because of my blocked scripts, which might be the case. Uh, no, it's not. Or maybe it is because of my, no, it doesn't seem, um, wait a second, I'm curious. No, it's just seem a bit jank. Okay, <laughs> it's not, not a big deal. You know, but it's still, you know, like at least the header looks really, really smooth and nice. But this is just a demo. So if you are looking to do page transitions in your Next.js app, then go ahead and do it. Um, having that app.js also allows <clears throat> for easier Apollo and Redux integration, which, you know, you no longer have to do any hacks or whatever. You can just do it in underscore app.js now, which is great. And there's, of course, uh, examples in the repo right now. So you can have a look at that. And uh, Babel 7, yes, this is probably the biggest improvement. So Babel 7, and there's like new proposals, new features, um, optional chaining and all that stuff theoretically could be enabled right now. So I'm gonna investigate that because that is one of the things I really, really want in my JavaScript. All right. Um, yeah, they've added the showcase as well. There's a surprising amount of really big websites uh, made with Next.js, including Magic Lip and, you know, stuff like... Uh, Netflix website, yeah, it's like some crazy things there. So yeah, Next.js is great. All right, next thing we have is Material UI version 1.0. It is uh, Material UI or Google Material Design components for React. If you never seen it, it is quite good. So there is, I don't, I don't know if there's a link from the article, but there's a link from the repo. So there we go. We got quite a lot of components and all of them are pretty good. The code is pretty straightforward. So nothing um, terrible here. Basically, you got very nice icons, very nice menus, so all that you can imagine from the material design, you got the steppers and stuff and it is all incredibly easy to use. And it is all also very, very lightweight. So if you're looking to make a material based app, then this is probably the UI that you should or the UI kit that you should have a look at. Um, I believe it is an MIT licensed project, is it? Yes, it is an MIT licensed project. So there you go. Okay, next release we got is at Atom 1.27. Um, <laughs> I am incredibly bored looking at the Atom um, release notes after VS Code release notes because VS Code guys just keep delivering insanely good stuff. And here's like, GitHub package improvements, great. Why do I care about that again? I, I mean, I guess GitHub guys pushing their GitHub stuff, but that's a bit underwhelming. So maybe step your game up to just a tiny bit, but whatever. Okay, let's continue. We got a Polka version 040 release. Um, it is quite, I mean, it's a pre one release. So it's, you can consider it a major release. There's quite a lot of changes in here. And uh, it actually, I believe, improved the memory usage almost like made it like twice better, I think. So there's some crazy optimizations there. So if you're looking for a low footprint ExpressJS alternative, then if you didn't know about Polka, then you know, this is your choice. And it just became better with version 0 0.4. 
All right, next release we got is a roll up 0.59 and 59.1 and um, they just keep amazing me. They just, they just added tree shaking of statically analyzable dynamic conditionals, which it just like, it just blows my mind. So just think about it for a second, right? So the tree shaking for, okay, it is still statically analyzable, but it's dynamic conditionals, which is insane. And it also added support for like ESM, import meta URL and some other things. Again, if you are uh, writing a library and don't wanna bring the webpack or whatever, then Rollup is a really, really good tool for that. So I use it in a bunch of libraries and it works just amazingly well. Okay, next release we have is a Greenlet 1.0. If you did not know about it, is a Greenlet allows you to take a function and execute it as a service worker, which is really helpful if you have some heavy computations. So, and it's the API are super simple. Like literally you just pass in a sync function and then you return whatever you want and then you get it as a result, right? So it is incredibly easy. It is 340 bytes gzipped, which is insane. Again, this is from developer, the guy behind Preact. So he's always doing like crazy tiny useful libraries. And okay, it's already 101, but Again, if you need to offload any heavy logic into the service worker, then have a look at that because it makes it extremely easy. Right, next release we got is a libui note 0 0.20. And the highlight of this release is styled strings. So if you did know, this is a bindings for libui, which is a, a cross-platform UI library for Node.js, or the bindings in for Node.js, the library is I believe C written in C and um, you can use Node.js to create cross-platform UIs for Unix, OSX or Windows in Node.js and they will look natively on all platforms. And you know, it looks good. So it actually looks good. And now you can have more cool things there like style strings, which is great. So yeah, um, continuing, we got the Nest 5, a major release of the Nest framework. Uh, which is a progressive Node.js framework for building efficient and scalable server-side apps. I believe they are now moved to Fastify as a backend. Uh, what? Okay. Um, I wonder if it's my internet or if it's, okay, there we go, now it works. That's a bit weird. Does my internet work fine? Yeah, it does, okay. So um, that is some hiccups on some ends, I don't know. Uh, I never used Nest myself, but I heard some good things about it. And there's a lot of people who seem to be enjoying it. So if you're looking for a complete framework for, you know, building the apps in a, with a TypeScript and object oriented way, um, have a look at Nest. I don't really have much more to say about it. Unfortunately, I have not tried it myself. It seems to integrate GraphQL, WebSockets and all that kind of stuff. So. Seems to be quite full to me. All right, continuing, we got uh, Firefox 61 developer edition just released this week on May 16th with um, better dark theme and uh, more developer, more powerful developer tools. Uh, so again, this is coming from the article debugging modern web applications where the DevTools uh, improvements were described, including the protocol and everything. And yeah, developer tools are better. So, you know, if you are liking Firefox, or if you need to test stuff in Firefox, then do have a look at Firefox Developer Edition, which is quite good. Right, continuing, we got a Visual Studio Live Share release. So you might be wondering like, hey, this stuff has been out for months already, right? So this is from what, April. And uh, the thing is that they just released the Visual Studio Live Share for VS Code. So you can actually, before that, you can only use it with uh, full Visual Studio, right? So you need the, the full thing on Windows or Mac, I think it only was. I don't, I don't do they support Linux actually? No, they don't, only, only Windows. Okay, so it's not even available on Mac. But now you can actually use uh, Visual Studio Live Share on VS Code on any platform. And it allows you to collaborate on code uh, with anyone remotely, right? So you can do like pair coding sessions in two seconds, basically, which is pretty great. So do have a look at it. All right, we're coming to the releases. Uh, so releases section is done. We're coming to libraries and demos section. Uh, we have quite a lot of stuff here as well today. So let's start with a signale or sig signal. I'm not, I guess it's signale, right? 
So it's a hackable console logger, probably something that I will use from now on because it looks really slick. So it has additional loggers that you can use, right? It has a hackable core. It has a very cool, neat, clean and beautiful output. Integrated timers, pluggable loggers, uh, file name, date, timestamp support, scope logging and timers, which is amazing. And a pretty minimal and simple syntax and API. So this is the basic version, right? So you just require it and use it. But then you can provide custom options for custom types. Uh, you can also provide override the types. Uh, and the cool thing was the scopes. So you can actually, when you create a new instance of it, you can provide it scope. And when you log from this instance, you will actually get the scope in the logs, which is really, really cool. And again, there's like a separate uh, loggers so you can actually hook it up to your Elasticsearch or whatever which is always great. So, you know, if you're looking for a new slick logger, do have a look at this one. Continuing, we got Ultra Dom, a minimal view layer for building declarative web interfaces. I, uh, to be honest, I'm still not sure how this compares to say, um, what was it? The, was it Mithril, I think, right? I think it was Mithril, yeah. So how does it compare to Mithril or Preact maybe even without the JSX? So theoretically, it's, it's basically the VDOM uh, implementation, uh, but there's no comparison to anything existing. So I'm not sure. But it, you know, if you're looking for another one, then have a look, it seems to be super tiny. So just 1.819 uh, kilobytes in JZIP size. So yeah, there we go. All right, then we have a tiny library from side guys called wait for a small utility that waits for the file to exist and optionally some permission set. Um, yeah, it's super, super simple. And uh, I guess alternative to Chalkidar, because I typically use Chalkidar for that stuff. Uh, it is, um, yeah, so it's a command line utility. And uh, this is what you would use within your Docker, I guess, or maybe some other things, right? So yeah, not exactly JavaScript, but uh, still maybe useful for some cases, I guess. That's why I was um, thinking Chalkidar because you know, you can really use it outside of the node. All right, continuing, we got React Native Gesture Handler, really neat uh, declarative API, allowing you to easily set up touch gestures. Um, if you ever tried writing React Native, you know that handling touch gestures beyond the very basic ones can be a pain in ass and um, this library basically makes it very easy. You just have the following classes, pan gesture, tap gesture, long press, rotation, fling and pinch. And all you have to do is just wrap your thing into this gesture handler and then set some parameters. That's it. That's just amazingly simple. And this is something I definitely gonna be using. <laughs> so yeah, if you need to handle gestures, do have a look at that. Continuing, we got react native DOM. Finally, someone done it. This is an experimental comprehensive port of react native for the web. So you Actually, you know, a lot of people, me including, was wondering why nobody did the React Native for web. And well, now there it is, right? So it actually is React Native for web. And this, this is a React Native app simply compiled to web. It actually provides you all React Native abstractions, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. Just look at that. It just works. I mean, you know, it might not look perfect because it's, a, it's supposedly mobile app. But if we say do this... There we go. Now we're mobile, right? And this stuff works. It's just, it's crazy. Like some people are insane. It is experimental as it says, but it's really cool to look at the source code and, and uh, read how it's done. It's also really cool. I'm like, there is some, uh, I believe there was a talk or a, or was it a Twitter chain about like discussion from the author about some things that happened under the hood. So anyway, it's really exciting to see where all that goes. Um, all right, continuing, we got another library from the author of Polka. It's called serve. I, I guess it's serve. Uh, it's an optimized middleware and a command line um, app for serving static files, something you could use with Polka, for example, or Express. And serve Klee's basically allows you to statically serve whatever you want. It seems to be, again, super optimized for um, um, number of requests and uh, per efficiency in terms of memory and CPU usage. As you can see here, it takes like it is uh, quite a lot more efficient than serve static, for example. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for something like this, do have a look at this one. Right, continuing, we got uh, create React app parcel, or as the author um, 
um, abbreviated it crap and it has a crap emoji here of course it's uh, essentially a create react app but with parcel instead of uh, webpack if for whatever reason you're looking to do this uh, to do a react app with parcel instead of webpack then this is probably the scaffolder you want looks pretty nice it is still pre-production essentially it's not even version 0.1 yet but it seems to be working so you know if you ever want to try it out go ahead all right, next thing we got is React Animated Tree. It's a simple React component that uh, gives you a simple configurable tree view with uh, pretty cool drop-in animations. So this is how it looks. If you ever, if you need to build some sort of a tree structure, do have a look at this, it looks pretty neat. So there's like, you know, seems well optimized, well built with all the nice things included. And uh, the API is also pretty nice looking. So yeah. All right, continuing, we got a uh, stock room from, again, Mr. Develop It, a guy behind Preact and all the crazy tiny libraries that are insanely useful. Stock room is a um, store management in a worker. So literally, so it's like you take your storage and you put it inside of a worker and then you use a store worker to communicate to it, which again can be really helpful if you want to offload all the stuff from UI and put it inside of a service worker. There you go. If you're having a problem with it, do have a look at that. Continuing, we got a data forge. It's a JavaScript data transformation and analysis toolkit inspired by pandas and link, uh, which I actually like both of them. And uh, the API for this one looks really good. Why didn't I start? I don't know. So um, it is really cool like it basically allows you to do things like this you know you read file you parse csv you parse dates in a specific column you parse ints in a specific column you drop specific column then you filter somehow then you select whatever the row you want and then you export it as csv and write to file this is again if you work with pandas or link that should look very familiar but this is javascript and you know it's always nice to have that I have not looked at the source code yet, but I'm hoping it works in a streams. So like with, or at least with streams so that, you know, it's not, um, not clogging your memory by loading the whole CSV in memory, because that might be a problem. I like, I found that node works extremely well with data transformation. Um, even with like 20 terabyte files, or no, not terabyte. Why am I saying 20 gigabyte files? So I managed to transform and process 20 gigabyte CSV files within a matter of hours. By using Node.js and we like eight gigabyte of RAM limit on a server, so just by using streams, so it's can it can be very efficient. Um, but yeah, so if you're looking for data transformation library, do have a look at this one. All right, continuing, we got Interview.js, a tool from, or I guess a framework from Al Jazeera guys, which is, um, looks very fancy, right? So it's a very nice looking thing, but it is, slightly weird. So I don't know if, if that's the format that I would want to read my interviews in. The idea is that you get um, several interviewees that talk about the same topic and you can talk to each of them as if you were conducting an interview and sort of in a chat format, which feels slightly weird. Um, like the cool thing is that you can actually choose the questions you ask and choose how many details you want to get from that interview. On the other hand, I would, I honestly prefer to just read the interview in like an article format. Maybe I'm just too old, I don't know. But nonetheless, you know, as a, as a, as a library, as a JavaScript tool, this is really, really fancy. So I really like it. Um, it, it is open source, so I can try it, have a look and uh, use it yourself, I believe. Is it? Oh no, it's actually a hosted tool. Okay, that might be... I, oh, developers, no, wait, oh, there we go. Okay, it is, it is. I was confused there for a second. I thought I saw the GitHub link somewhere. There we go. So yeah, um, I mean, maybe, you know, a better a better application for it. Actually, maybe interview is a worse application for it, but as a sort of interactive knowledge base, that might be a pretty cool thing. All right, continuing, we got require so slow. Um, why is your require taking so much time? It's essentially a profiler for required uh, functions. It is really easy to use. You literally just require so slow, then require something. And then you write a stack trace, uh, which you can load in one of the Chrome trace viewers, for example. Have a look at why exactly your require is slow and optimize for that. So really straightforward tool. All right, uh, then we got warrior.js. Um, 
it is a game, so it is not exactly a library or anything. Hey, Strax, uh, what do you mean you're dying? Please don't die. We, we still need your year. <laughs> All right, so it's a pretty cool game uh, where you have to code your warrior and then launch the game and see what he does. And then essentially, you know, repeat that to optimize your warrior and figure out, uh, I guess, win the game. I haven't tried it myself yet. I honestly didn't have enough time to do that, but it looks really cool and I really want to try it because so sort of coding games when you have to code your own bot, I guess, yes, and uh, send him to do stuff is always exciting to me. So I played quite a bit of those. Want to try that. So, you know, if, if that sounds like your thing, do have a try. All right, next thing we got is reactive.how. This is 2.0 alpha. Um, podcast is giving your energy. That's great to hear. I mean, man, I'm really happy to hear that, you know, uh, you enjoy this stuff. All right, so we have reactive.how. This is um, RxJS, essentially. Not, not like, okay, not strictly RxJS. This is more or less reactive programming thing, right? So there's like RxJS, whatever other implementations. This is a visual explanation of uh, how the things look, right? So you can actually have a look at how the reactive Redux works. And of course, it blocked all my videos. Let me just permit that real quick. There we go. And you actually, you have a visual representations of what's the difference between reduce in a reactive stream and a scan in a reactive stream, which is can be immensely useful, especially if you're just starting with the reactive programming and you want to understand the reactive streams better. So do have a look at that. I think they're adding some new things here according to this. So we're staying tuned and see what can they add more because as you might know, I'm a huge fan of RxJS and reactive programming in general, at least for some use cases. So having things like this is always extremely helpful. All right, next thing we have is, well, this is actually quite old, but I thought maybe some people did know about it and I didn't talk about it yet on a podcast. So it is called serviceworker.rs. It is from Mozilla guys and it's essentially a cookbook for service workers that literally describes a bunch of use cases and gives you a recipe. So, you know, hey, I wanna do push and retrieve a payload. It's a beginner use case, it's a web push and uh, literally probably blocked all the frames and everything. And the use case is empty, what? Oh, there's a demo, there we go. Okay, so there's actually, where's my, wait a second, where's my, read me, where's my code? What is, oh, there's there's the code, okay. <laughs> Got it confused, confused for a second, just, just for a second. There you go, so you actually see the full source code here and you have a demo in place, you can actually try it and if you allow the notifications, then notification and uh, where's my notification, please send it to me, no? Is it blocked? Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, right side, uh, just missed it. So as you can see, it works pretty well. And there's a lot of pretty cool use cases here. And you know, offline status, JSON cache, local downloading, virtual server. And I think they keep extending it because last time I checked it, it was way, way, way smaller. All right, last thing we have is a list of things. It's called build your own X and X is actually insert, insert your technology here. So it's um, you know similar to building X with JS, and it's a really really cool uh, list of things that uh, basically links to the tutorials on building your own 3D renderer, blockchain, bot, database, Docker, emulator, like whatever you can imagine. There is a lot of really cool things here. So if you ever wanted to try your hands in something that you didn't know how to approach, like regex engine or physics engine or operating system or neural network. There's a bunch of languages here and there's like four of them in JavaScript, holy shit. So this is a really great start for you. Um, do have a look at it. It does have quite a lot of really good things and there's even uncategorized ones. We are building NAND to Tetris. Okay, modern computer, okay. <laughs> you can't even build your own computer, there you go. So it's like, <laughs> it's just insane. All right, and uh, now for the fun bit, uh, I just found this performance tip absolutely amazing. So you just bind on error to window close and you get that native fail, which I think is extremely funny. Um, I won't laugh because I already laughed at it 24 times and I can't laugh anymore. Still find it amazing. And uh, yeah, this is basically all I have to say. 
Once again, all this stuff is on GitHub. If you're watching this on YouTube, this stuff should be down below in the description. If you're watching this on Twitch, there should be a link to the YouTube, uh, no, sorry, to the GitHub somewhere in the channel description. That's basically all I have for you for today. If you have any questions or you think I missed something this week, feel free to throw it in the chat. I will wait for a couple of minutes and uh, give you time to post your questions, things into chat. If not, we can just wrap it up here and go have our nice weekend and watch some TV shows, movies and play some video games. So there we go. Uh, thank you, Mehmatrix. I do think it was a great stream as well. That was pretty cool. And uh, even though we did not have that many articles this time around, there was quite a lot of really cool libraries and demos, which I really dig. Um, yes, we do have a holiday on Monday. I probably will be working because of the startups and all that stuff. Um, not much, but I will do some stuff because we have some deadlines there. Uh, but yes, it is generally a vacation. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, it, cheers indeed. I mean, I do plan to drink some beer at least on Monday, you know, to and uh, go to maybe watch the new Deadpool. This is something I wanted to do. I'm not sure if there's any screenings uh, on Monday, but we'll see. I mean, Germany can be tough on holidays because everything is closed. <laughs> maybe just go and drink some beer in some pub or something. You know, you know, it works. All right, guys, any more questions or things? Have you watched New Avengers? No, I have not watched New Avengers yet. I somehow missed them completely in the cinemas. Uh, like, I live in Leipzig, so we have a very limited time slot when they show things in English, and I prefer to watch everything in the original, like in English. And I missed that slot, and now I don't really want to watch them in German, so I'm just waiting for the DVD, I guess. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to be trying to evade the spoilers for the next like half a year or something. Probably going to be terrible and I'm probably going to get spoiled everything for me anyway, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Wait for the second part to watch it together. Ah, yeah, that might be a good idea, actually. That might be a good idea. I haven't thought about that, but it's going to be even harder to evade all the spoilers. <laughs> God damn it. All right. <laughs> Okay, guys, any more questions? By the way, I've enabled the new Twitch beta low latency live streaming. So theoretically, you should have, uh, or I, at least I should see your questions and you should see my questions in the stream way quicker than before. I hope at least the low latency stuff works and it's just not, was not just useless switch in the settings. So, but uh, you know. Anyway, uh, do we have any more questions or? Seems so great. Okay, that's really awesome. Uh, really happy to hear that it works. Uh, it goes, it's always nicer to not wait for 20, 30 seconds for people to actually get your question. <laughs> always feels a bit awkward when you like ask questions and just it like <laughs> two, three seconds. That's really cool. Cool. That's really great. Nice. All right. Okay, guys. So do you have any other things that you want to talk about you want to discuss any other questions if not then i would go and uh, yeah i guess uh chill in my evening maybe play some fortnite that sounds like a good plan all right looks like no more questions uh, have a nice weekend as well thank you for watching and as usual i see you next week bye guys